Hey guys, I'm back. Um, today's uh, devotion is going to be based on uh, a story that we've all heard um, in Christians and non Christians alike. Um, the story of the lost, or the prodigal son, the lost son. And that comes from Luke 15, 11 to 32. I'm going to read from the Message Bible. Um, uh, I believe that what God wants me to do today is to actually just share His Word. Um, brainstorm some ideas and some questions I've got out of that and, and some of the revelation that it will work with to me uh, which I believe is going to be very useful for some of these guys to, to ponder upon and also then I'll touch a little bit on my uh, through my uh, study Bible and how that's relevant to us today um, hopefully God will give me a little some words as well for some people out there and we'll finish up with some prayer so uh, this is from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 15, um, verse 11, verses 11 to 32. I'm reading from the message Bible. Then he said, he, he is talking about Jesus. There was once a man who had two sons. The youngest said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. He wanted his, his inheritance. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the youngest son packed his bag and left for a distant country. There, when disciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all of his money, there was a bad famine all through the country and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who was signed into his fields to swap the pigs to feed the pig. He was so hungry that he would have eaten the corn pots in the pig slot, but no one would give him. Him. That brought him to his senses. He said, All this farmhand working for my father sit down for three meals a day, and here I am starting to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son, but take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him, his heart pounding, he ran out, embracing and kissing. The son started his feet. Father, I've sinned against God, I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son over again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants, Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put a family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain fed, a pipe up, and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time his oldest son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. And as he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling, calling over one of the house boys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecue feast, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry salt and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving, never giving you one moment to leave. But have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then this son of yours who has thrown away your money on prostitutes, shows up, and you go all out for the kids. His father said, Son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time, and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time we have to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. Okay, so what was Jesus trying to say in this parable? Well, I'm trying to give a very quick, uh, coming to, looking at it through my study Bible, I'll give a quick context on the background and, and the situation that, that uh, the people were in, Jesus was in, when he was saying this. He was actually surrounded by people that were listening to his teachings, people that were listening to him, but also surrounded by Pharisees. Now, he was surrounded by the religious leaders of the time who were there uh, most of them there to try and trap him, to try and, uh, and catch him saying something that uh, could incriminate him in any way. So there is a meaning behind 
uh, this parable. And yes, this parable was not just talking to his, uh, uh, to, to, to the public and to the people around him, but it was also talking, he was trying to talk to the Pharisees and to make them see um, the way that they were behaving as well. So at the time that Jesus um, began telling the parable of the lost son, of the prodigal son, he had already said two other parables. And that was first was the, the parable of the lost sheep. Then he was talking, then he spoke about the, the lost coin. And eventually he went on to the lost son, to the prodigal son. Uh, the son, the younger son, represents a rebellious uh, figure. Uh, the younger son was one of those people. He was, he thought he had, uh, the rights to, uh, rebel against his father. He thought he had the rights to disrespect his authority and, and he said, okay. I don't have to put up with this. I, I want my share. I want to go out there and enjoy myself. I don't have to follow your rules, your regulations. You don't know what you're talking about. Blah, 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 blah. So he got his share and he, and he rebelled against And he did everything he, he, he wanted to do out, of, out there in the world. And basically, the Bible tells us he's, uh, that he was left with nothing. He was left in, in, in desolation. He was left with, with no food to eat, no money to, uh, to do anything. The Father in this story represents Father God, represents our Father, our, our Lord, and, and the love that He has for us, um, and how He constantly pursues us and wants a relationship with us, and is quick to forgive and quick to, to rejoice in, in the coming of His children. You see, the older brother represents the Pharisees and their behavior, their refusal to mix with those people, their, their attitude and their heart attitude, uh, their self-righteousness attitude. And they were angry. They were angry and resentful that sinners who were being welcomed into God's kingdom. They felt as if, after all, they thought, you know, we have sacrificed and done so much for God. How easy it is for these to, to resent God's gracious forgiveness of others whom we consider far worse sinners than ourselves. Reality is we may not acknowledge this in, in the way that we speak, but God can see the heart. God can see our heart and see what's really in there and why are the intentions, uh, the real intention behind our actions, behind our, 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 uh, our words and the way we behave. Um, many a times we are more quick to con condemn people than to actually show them grace and to actually love them and love them back into the body of Christ. It says here, why were the Pharisees bothered that Jesus associated with these people? Well, the religious leaders were always careful to stay clean according to the Old Testament law. So in fact, they were well beyond the law in their avoidance of certain people and situations in their ritual washings. They had certain ritual washings that they would do. And, and just like the Hindu caste system, the Hindu religion, Hinduism, um, they were not even allowed to, to in any way to touch or to uh, fellowship with, with people who were deemed as unclean in society. By contrast, though, Jesus took the concept of cleanness lightly. He risked defilement by touching lepers and by neglecting to wash within the Pharisees' prescribed manner. He showed complete disregard for the sanctions against associating with certain classes of people. He came to offer salvation to sinners, to show that God loves them. Jesus didn't worry about his accusations. Instead, he continued going on to those who needed him, regardless of the effect of these rejected people might have on his reputation. And when we act like that, when we are too quick to, to condemn, and we act like the very legalistic, and we can't do this, we can't do that, uh, we are acting like the Pharisees. Now, I don't have time to get into that, but you know, you can check the Bible and you'll see that um, Jesus was quite strong in his word in the way that he spoke to the Pharisees, because he saw um, the way that they were acting. He saw the and he felt their heart and the, the intentions behind their actions and their words and the way that they behaved with people, and um, he had the discernment to do with them. He had the, the wisdom to know how to deal with them. And 
love them and he wanted them to turn away from their actions, to turn away from their ways and to see the reality, to see what he was trying to show, the example that he was setting, that it wasn't about ritual washings and all that sort of stuff, if your heart is in the wrong place. Jesus, um, Jesus' own words were, the kingdom of God is at hand. He did not say the church is at hand, um, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. The church has a role to play, and that is to release the kingdom of God into the world. And we are those, uh, those tools that, that God uses to do that. And if we can't do it with our own brothers and sisters in love, and yes, there are times where um, we have to hold each other accountable, and that requires acts of correction, that requires uh, loving rebukes um, of certain attitudes and, and, and that our brothers and sisters may be leading, which is inappropriate. Um, but, but even that needs to be done in love. And, and there's many examples that God set, that Jesus himself set, that we can see in the Bible and take as as examples for us to follow. Uh, but it is important that we don't fall into the habit of acting the way that the person acted. And I believe one of the reasons why that happens is because as much as we read it out there, read it in books, we read it in the Bible, as much as we hear it through preaching, um, and some of us, as much as we preach it, um, we haven't really acknowledged, we, we haven't, it hasn't really sinked in our hearts that we are meant to live as sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are part of His family, first of all. Um, however, uh, we have, over the years, uh, gone into a trend of acting as servants. Uh, we are in a time where we are moving from a mentality of church to kingdom. Church produces offices, while kingdom produces sons and daughters, not limited to a specific office. Now, this is very important because uh, because of the fact that we've, we've gone from a kingdom mentality to a church mentality, we're not producing fathers any longer, and that's one of the biggest issues in the church, that there is a huge need for fathers in the church, fathers who produce sons, and sons who then become fathers and produce more sons. It's important that we realize and we live out as a family. The church is meant to be a family, not meant to be an organization. It's not meant to be a, a, a membership, a social club, or um, because when we get into that habit, we produce officers then it becomes impersonal. There's no relationship there. And it's very easily for us to start convincing people, to start saying, hey, your job is to do this, this, and this. Your job is to follow these rules. Uh, now that you're a member, you can't, you can do this, but you can't do that. And Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus didn't say any of that. Our, our role as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a family, is to love them. And to allow the Holy Spirit to then convict them and guide them and, and in the process of the, that conviction, then that these people may ask us, our brothers and sisters may ask us, please help me through this issue. And we are meant to be there to do that. We are meant to be there to lovingly walk with them in, that, in those struggles and to, and to overcome and see that, that victory eventually. And because tomorrow we may be in that situation and we will need their strength and we will need their help as well. That's why God has created the church. And, we are not here to condemn them. The Bible tells us that we are, we are already condemned before we accept God anyway. Uh, but we are here to love one another. We, and it's through that love, as it tells us in the Bible, the description of it, tells us in the, in, in the Bible that uh, it's through the love of Christ and, and the love of our brother, uh, towards brothers and sisters that the world will see God. Now, if we can't even love our brothers and sisters, if we can't live in that harmony, in that unity, why would others come? Why would others follow us? There's enough trouble as it is. There's enough disunity. There's enough persecution out there. Um, why would they come to another place where they're going to be condemned and make it feel worse? It's important that in everything that we do, that we do it with love. In everything that we do, that we do it with, within the identity that God has given us. Um, I'll give you a clear example, a simple example, but. Um, uh, very relevant to this, to this situation. Uh, before I was a Christian, I used to uh, be a soccer fanatic, a football fanatic, football, real football. 
And uh, when I used to get home, many, many times I used to get home and I would, I would like, I love my milkshakes and stuff like that. So I used to do smoothies and milkshakes. And now I would use sweet, but I'd use so many different foods. And I knew I could just pick them up and do it. I didn't have to ask my parents. It was there and it was accessible to me. And I knew who I was. I didn't have to say, Dad, Mom, can I pick that up? And I used that. Um, because I knew who I was, I knew the authority that had been given to me. I knew what I could access and couldn't access, and I used it. And my brother, and my sister didn't stop me. They didn't come up to me and say, "Hey, don't use those fruits because then there's not going to be any left over for me." They knew if there was any more, but our parents would just go and get some more. Um, and they would, they, they enjoyed. Sometimes we would do milkshakes for the whole family. We all enjoyed it. So, um, in a way, that's a very simplistic example, but that's that's the reality of the story. Uh, reality is that the, the the oldest son didn't really know his place in the household. He didn't really understand the identity and the access that he had to the kingdom of God, to the, to the father's uh, inheritance. Like the father told him, you have everything you live in. You. you can access anything you want. You don't even have to ask. You want a party? You party. He, he had everything accessible to him, but because he didn't know his identity, he wasn't living out of his identity as his son. He, he, he didn't even know how to enjoy that blessing. And when somebody else was able to be blessed by his, his father, somebody else who had the same uh, um, rights and so the same um, uh, inheritance as him, he was unable to even enjoy it with his dad or with his brother. Or to even rejoice in the fact that he's got it from after death. Now, when we live out of the identity as sons and daughters, we uh, love what he loves. We love what our body loves. We love, uh, we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. We learn to access the things of heaven and, and, and the kingdom of God, as it says in Luke, so the kingdom of God is within us. We learn how to release that kingdom. And I think that's a big issue in the church. Many of us fall into the issue that we believe in, we fall into the, into the trap like, like the Pharisees in the story, we fall into the trap like the older brother. Um, we've got a great, great news is that uh, Father God, uh, that our Lord, He's ready to forgive us so long as we acknowledge that. So as long as we are willing to change and to renew our minds and to go back to His own soul, Lord, help me. Help me to love them as you love them. Help me to see the love you see. Help me to live out my life and fulfill your purpose as a son, as a daughter of the most high God. That's why we are here. Uh, I like what Bobby Connor said. Um, he said, you know, we have a purpose here on earth. Um, if we didn't, then all we would need is to um, uh, ministries, and that would be the evangelist and the assassin. Evangelist and the assassin bank. To get you straight to heaven. But that's not what God is looking for. He's left us here on earth for a purpose. And we have a role to play in continuing in his good works as Jesus said. And he's enabled us. He's put everything that he has, he's put into us. And we can access that. It's 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 done through faith. It's done through love. Ultimately love is the key in everything we do. We need to have the love of God. And we need to constantly every single day. Uh, have a new, fresh infilling with continuing His work with prayer and fasting. And as we do that, and as we push into it, obviously, um, it, it brings us closer together as, as the body of Christ. And, and people will be attracted to us. And people will be attracted to what is in that person? Why is that person so loving, so caring? Why is that person so quick to do? Um, I don't know what situation you're all going through, but I know that every single person has issues in their life. Every person has problems. Um, some more, some are worse than others. Um, the reality is God is still crying out to you. God is still pursuing you. God still loves you. And whatever anybody's told you, whatever failures people may have had and legalistic actions and words that have hurt you so bad, that is not a representation of who God is. What areas in my life do I need to change? Well, if you don't know God, that's the first one. Cry out to Him, ask Him. Because you need Him. 
we were created to relate to have a real relationship with him. And he's real. If you cry out to him, he will answer. Because that's all he does. That's all he does. He's constantly pursuing us. He wants his family back. This message is, is a message of edification. This message is, is a message of accountability. It's a message uh, to warm and to inspire the hearts of, of, the, of the members of the body of Christ. I believe that it is our role, each one of us, to hold each other accountable. It's, it's not just the pastor's role, it's not just the evangelist, it's not just the, the apostle. Don't pile all that pressure and all that you, all these responsibilities onto your pastor. Uh, we all have a role to play. Um, we will all answer to God for what we have done and have we done. And we all have the same importance. We can't, like the Bible says, you know, the hand can't take to the feet that you know, are more important because the truth is uh, every part of our body is just as important for us to survive and for us to function properly. So, same thing with the church. In this story, I want to encourage and inspire the church to, to seek God for more discernment. We need more discernment in, in these days. To seek God for more wisdom. To seek God for a fresh infill in each and every single day of his life. Um, I want to, and uh, I'd like to finish in prayer. Father God, I thank you for, for your wonderful word, which is life. I thank you, Jesus, that you came to exemplify uh, the right model for us in the way that we should live, in the way that we should treat others, Lord. Uh, I thank you for the body of Christ in your church, uh, that you give us um, and, and release more of your wisdom upon us, Lord. That you just pour out more of your love, that we may love others that we love, see them and just see them. And that we may love and, and uh, know and, and live out of your true identity. Because the word says that we need to love others as we love ourselves. If we do not love ourselves, if we do not know who we are, how can we love others? Really? So please, we, we ask you to refresh and fill in each and every single day of your wisdom, a fresh and fill in of your love, a fresh and fill of, of your compassion, Lord. and that you uh, do not let our hearts grow cold like the world, but Lord, let, let our hearts be broken with the things that they get hard. Let us love each other and love each other. Help us to pursue the things that you pursue, uh, to seek your kingdom first above all things, above everyone, and to be uh, the godly encounter that this world needs. Help us, Lord, first of all, to do it in our home, to do it in, in, in the church, and to, um, to continue on spreading your fire, to continue to stay and spreading your life in every part of our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, and just invade every part of our lives. Invade our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, our words, everything. Possess us with your holy presence. And just pour out your glory, pour out your life, pour out your love, pour out more of your love. Let it make us living epistles out of flames of fire, lights of the world, and souls of the earth. Let your church arise, Lord, in righteousness and holiness, in power and truth and love. To impact society, not to be infected with the ways of this world, but to impact and infect this world. Because ultimately, you are more powerful than anything in this world. So take away all the fear, take away all the shame, take away all the ignorance and misunderstandings, mis, um, take away all the deceitful uh, doctrines and, and, and just the wrong uh, things that we've been indoctrinated with, uh, the cycle that we've been led into in the church, Lord, I pray that you just break down the walls and release, release your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for your empire, we thank you for your love, we thank you for your presence, that we may be the love of God out there, that we gave our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you next time.